very good afternoon to all of you. Today happens to be the fourth edition of the Big Data Initiative Public Lecture Series. And today we will have talks by Professor Chiranji Bhattacharya and Professor Jayant Haritsa. At the outset, let us give them both a very warm welcome. I would like to welcome all of you as a very special welcome to all of our alumni and all those of you who are working in various organizations outside the institute and who have weathered the hot sun and come to the faculty hall for these uh, lectures. So thank you for coming for these lectures. We are really enthused by the excellent response we have been receiving for the public lecture series of the Big Data Initiative. And today we will have uh, two talks. The first of the talks will be by Professor Chiranji Bhattacharya. And I have the pleasure of introducing my colleague, uh, Professor Chiranji. He is fondly and popularly called as Chiru. And he teaches the machine learning course. He does research on theoretical aspects of machine learning. And he applies uh, all his results in various domains. And uh, he has actually completed several successful collaborative engagements with a host of global R&D companies in this area. So he's our own product. Uh, he completed his PhD from the Department of Computer Science and Automation, working with Professor Satyakirti. And uh, he got the best thesis award for PhD. Let's congratulate him for that. <laughs> and he also spent uh, postdocs uh, with uh, Professor Michael Jordan from the University of California, Berkeley, and also with uh, Professor Amari. Both of them are uh, you know, celebrities in the area of machine learning. So today, Professor Chiranji will be talking to us about learning from big data uh, and how statistics can be used for taming the complexity of this problem. Professor Chiranji, let's welcome him. Thank you, Professor Narari, for this kind introduction. So today, I'm going to talk about the challenges we face when we want to learn models from data. So often, uh, learning models from data can pose as optimization problems. Is it my code working? Hello? Not working? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good. See, that's the one good thing about being a teacher. So, okay. So, uh, as I might get set, uh, so let's do this. So, you're saying that learning problems, uh, learning models from data, can be posed as optimization problems. Now, optimization problems in the big data setting often leads to large-scale optimization problems. <coughs> now, the scale becomes a challenge. When I can solve the problem in small scale. When the scale becomes large, I can't solve anything. However, because I'm not solving any other problem, I'm solving a statistical problem, because machine learning problems are often statistical in nature. So statistics might help, can be a friend, you know, in taming this complexity. To, to this end, I will present two ideas. This is joint work with uh, Professor Saket Nath. He's now a faculty in IIT Bombay. Uh, and Mr. Krishnan, who is now in Microsoft, and Professor Ramesh Hariharan and Professor Murthy. So, so, I mean, for most of you are already enthused by big data. For those of you who are not, so here is uh, the first point, that era of big data is upon us. So we'll give us a brief introduction uh, to how various sources of data are created, and it's creating interesting problems and technologies. So uh, through that, we'll introduce machine learning as an, nothing but an optimization problem. So where every data point will give you a constraint. So more data points, more constraints. So this makes the problem difficult. Okay? And to this end, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about two approaches. One is randomized algorithms, another is through chance constraints. 
So don't worry if, you, if you're hearing these terms for the first time. I'll try to explain it as I go along. Please feel free to ask questions. So, so as I said, there are big data is upon us. So with the advent of internet and with a revolution in so-called sensor technologies, we are flooded with data. So more data that we can manage. So just to give you an example, let me start with a personal anecdote. So how big data technologies are having an impact on our lives. A couple of years ago, uh, I was in a sabbatical in Sweden. So we landed in Sweden at 7 p.m. Like we went and checked in the apartment. 7 p.m. So me, my wife, and my five-year-old daughter. So we have to make dinner. We are all very tired. So as any, most of you, if you have five-year-olds, you know they're very fussy. If they decide, they'll eat this, and that's the thing you'll get to, right? And we are all very tired. We can't reason with her, right? So she decides. I mean, so whatever is, there's very, very few things in the apartment. So she said, well, I want fruit custard. And that's something we have every day. So as fruit custard, you know, custard powder, you, uh, you make a custard out of it, and then add fruits to it, a nice dessert, you know, and she likes that. Now fruits, I, there's a shop nearby. So fruits available, custard powder. You go buy it, okay, go to the shop. It's very, it's very close, 10 minutes walk. Go to the shop, ask the shopkeeper, custard powder, do you have custard powder? The shopkeeper looks at me. I mean, in Sweden, people understand English. And I can see that, you know, she's trying to help me. She's looking at very quizzically, you know, her forehead all crinkling and, custard powder, custard powder. No, sir, sorry. Now what do you do? Luckily, there's internet. I came back home, there's internet. I check, put it in Google Translate. So in Sweden, they do not sell custard powder as we know here. They sell uh, something which is called vanilla flavored powder. So vanilla sauce means vanilla flavored, pulvar means powder in Swedish. I go back to the shop, go to the counter, get the product and check it out myself. This is an example of how big data technologies are changing our lives. And the way this Google Translate was built, it was not built by standard NLP experts. What Google did, I mean, that's what they claim they did. Nobody knows for sure what has gone into it. <laughs> At least you look in the web page, they says that we, what we did was we collected all kinds of corpuses in all languages, and then started learning statistical rules on it. And out came this product. So here's an example of how, how our lives are changed in many ways, you know? So, so, so we'll not dwell on this. And this so, but let's review that why we say our big data is upon us. Now, as most of you know, the, have at least heard the word data mining, right? So data mining has its origins in astronomy. You know? So that's where data mining came, you know? So, so what they do in astronomy is, they call sky surveys. That is a telescope, looks at the sky, collects all kinds of images. From the images you have to label, like this is a meteor, this is a planet, this is a solar system, this is a galaxy. So that's called sky surveys, right? So that's where, you know, analyzing that today is known as a result in the science of data mining. So even today, Sloan Digital Sky Survey collects 200 GB per night. So now you have to look at those images and you know, decide, uh, as we said, this is discussed, uh, whether there is a meteor here or planet there, et cetera. So we have heard about this Higgs boson experiment. Maybe physicist friends can tell us more about that. So there, we are, I understand that they use this large hadron collider. I mean, it collects 25 petabytes per year. Petas 10 to the power 15. So, so this, is, this data is coming out from fundamental sciences, right? And you say, okay, this is people who are doing foundational sciences, they're collecting data, okay, fine. It's interesting, but it is confined to the sciences. Now, large corporations, like Walmart, I'm sure Reliance is also having the same thing, I guess. So they are handling one million customer transactions per hour. So this is the data volume we're looking at. And now, apart from fundamental science and business, so analysis of this kind of data is also having other impacts. For example, it is said that Professor, uh, or President Obama's victory uh, can be attributed to in large amounts to big data analysis. 
this, this, this is absolutely. We don't know about that. <laughs> At least so, OK. So as a, when giving a talk, this is all gleaned from Wikipedia. So we do not know yet. So, so yeah. So yeah, you see, this, this is so collecting, storing, you know, modeling, processing, this large amounts of data is known as big data analysis. And as I was saying, it's having lots, all kinds of very interesting positive effects on our lives. But here again, you might say, OK, it's confined to fundamental sciences, big corporations, politicians. What do I care? But I can tell you, you are still creating a lot of data. Look at this. This is data created every minute globally. One lakh tweets per minute. 48 hours of video footage is uploaded on YouTube every minute. This is as per 2012. You know, two lakh queries, two million queries, Google handles per minute. Six lakh posts in Facebook. You can see the volumes, right? This is all of people like you and me do. Unfortunately, I don't use Twitter. I don't upload things on YouTube. OK, I use Google, nor Facebook either. Anyway. So, so you see, there's a nice uh, picture you know, somebody created from which I collected this data. It's available here. But what is more fascinating to me is this thing. This is number of emails globally sent out. 284 million emails per minute. Please cooperate with me. If I ask you to put your hand up, please do. How many of you have Gmail accounts? So you can send all of them is handled by Google, right? <laughs> Correct? So now let us say Google email manager. Look at his challenge. He has to, you know, these emails have to go to the right addresses, they must be stored, and you know, all kinds of things. Right? So this is a challenge. Now let us, let us, so there are, there are two kinds of challenges here. One is systemic, you know, where will I store and where, how will this email reach to one place to the other, et cetera, right? But there's also another very important challenge. See, according to, so here's an article in BBC, right? It says 97% of all emails are spam. So you see, if Google doesn't filter those spam emails, I'll be sunk. I won't be able to find important emails. All right? So this is an interesting big data problem, and it will serve as a motivation for our talk. Okay? So now, obviously, so we see to to do this, you have to do it in a war footing. So Google has declared war on this. So war and spam. So so here is. I, I'm sorry if you can't see this. So there is a report here that Google colleagues have written. So it's a report from the front lines. Of, so the main challenge they find, you know, it's a very interesting report where they talk about how to use machine learning to figure out what is spam. So the main, one of the challenges they they they, uh, they point out is that we need algorithms which can handle large amounts of email, like in millions, <laughs> and now each email is described by all kinds of features. Now here I'm not sure how much they respect privacy. That's also another issue. For the time being, let's keep that out of the picture. So because they, because they shouldn't read email, private emails and all that. So there's a big thing, which is a gray area, which I'm not going into. But by and large, you know, each email they describe in many, many ways. So what could that be? For example, is the email copied to a lot of people? Is the email copied to undisclosed recipients? So all kinds of features you put in. These are hand-coded features by, put by system engineers. And so there's no one way you can catch spam. So you have to describe the email in all possible ways. So that is sometimes called features in our parlance, and that's also been done to a million features. So each email is described by a million values, and there are a million emails. Now this kind of data I need to, you know, uh, I can I, I need to process and come up with models which can say, give a new email is a spam or not. This is a challenge, and this then they clearly identify that there's no good algorithms for that, and they're fighting with it. But of course, whatever they're doing, they're doing very well. So having this brief introduction, let me now uh, see how machine learning can help. And actually, this our friends in Google say that they use support vector machines for this problem. So that would be, we'll, we'll describe. So I, I, I will use that, I'll use that as an excuse to talk about machine learning as an optimization problem. 
OK, so we'll take this problem of declaring emails as spam. So, I, so when I look into my spam fol folder, right? so I bring out an email. So I just, this is the, I, I have, I'm not showing the headers and all that. But this is the email I see. Is it spam? Who knows? But it's sent to a professor like me. It's definitely going to be spam. No interest in business. And and first of all, and the next thing is I'm not going to pay any fees for this. So Google, some way, without knowing any of this, has described discusses, has described as spam. So as we discussed, so what should you do? Take the email, describe it. So let's do it. So describe it by a big vector, right? So this is was it copied to all kinds of was it copied to many people? You know. Did, uh, did it have, uh, uh, did it come from a very shady place, you know? Or uh, uh, did they use this, something like this? Is it asking for payment? All kinds of things. I do not know what features have gone in, right? So for us now, each email is like nothing but a big vector of numbers. It can be counts, counting number of words, or it can be saying one or zero that these things are happened or not, etc. right? Now, and what is our job? Our job is that, can you create a function which will take in this email, this description, and say it's spam or not. That's the idea, right? So, so now support vector machines have been used for this. So, so, so here is a couple of slides discussion of that. So SVMs, for short, are, are nothing but linear classifiers. So what's a classifier? We say the following. That let's say x be a big vector, as you discussed, and w is another vector. So this is this gives me a number. So so W transpose X minus B is a number. Right? Sign of that number will give me what? One or minus one? Right? Okay. Now our so so that's our classifier, we'll say. That X comes, I'll tag it with one or minus one. Now you you can say that one means spam, minus one means okay, all kinds of things. Right? So how do I learn this? So the next question become, comes is how do I learn W and B? Now for that you'll be given a data set. So data set will have all the emails, if I say so, and a description, a tag, saying that it is spam or not spam. Correct? And, let me, and let's go with this argument that spam is 1 and regular is minus 1. Right? So now, so then what should be our objective in, in finding w and b? I want, a, I want a w and b, right? such that my predictions on all these examples are right. So what is it? I know yi is my is it spam or not. I know somebody has given me that, right? And fxi is my prediction. So yi equal to fxi, right? They should agree. Now this agreement can be written as a constraint like this. Now see, this quantity must be greater than one is one way of enforcing that yi equal to fxi. Fine. Now please look at so the the interest is this. So so for each i I will get a constraint. For each email, I'll get a constraint like this. Now, for a million emails, I'll get million constraints. That is what I was saying, that you know, machine learning, when you go to optimization framework, my constraints increase the number of data points. Right? And so what is W? So W is, again, a vector of D variables. So this is an optimization problem in D plus 1 decision variables and N constraints. Now, for small d, small n, things are nice. MATLAB can do that. But as D and N increases, we get into trouble. And big data problem is all about that. Right. So, so maybe, so again, let, let, let's, let me take a one more slide to introduce the basic aspect of machine learning. So this machine learning is often you know, fitting, so, so, so fitting models to data, right? So this discusses, so, this, so these pink things are actually, you're fitting the data. Y must be equal to fxi, right? And then this notion is suppose if there are multiple models, which one should I choose from? For that, I need a measure of complexity. So here we have decided the measure of complexity is something like the norm of the vector. Okay? So there are theories for this. So essentially, this this so fitting the simplest possible hypothesis is what we are trying to do now. Right? So machine learning is all about this. Right? So now let's let's focus for a moment. Now we'll talk about specifics of the SVM problem. That's the problem we talked about here. So now, this problem can be alternatively written as another problem where the variables are no longer in W. Here I need to solve something else. My variables are called alphas, something. Where alpha and W are related by the, by the following equation. 
right? It's an equivalent problem. It is kind of obtained through duality, but let us not get into that. So, so all I'm saying is this problem is exactly equivalent to the previous problem, where W and, and alpha related through this equation. Now, the alpha, how many alphas are there? Number of examples. Okay. So, if I solve this problem, I have to find n values of alpha. Okay. So, the, so that is objective here. So, we, I want you to remember. I want you to remember just this equation and this. So, here the, you have some constraints on alpha. I say alpha must be greater than zero, right? So, so here see w is described by alpha one, y one, something alpha two, alpha three, and all that, right? So, alphas can be zero or positive. So now, support vectors are those vectors for which alpha is strictly positive. I just want you to remember this. Nothing else. So there is a very nice, interesting geometric view of this. The geometric view is that as if, let's say this, this part, all these spam emails are residing. And on this part, all those emails which are regular are residing. And the classifier is right in between. And the operation problem is trying to, to find out the distance between these two sets. Okay, these sets are often more mathematically described as convex hulls. So this is the convex hull of all spam emails. This is the convex hull of all negative emails. Oh, sorry, the good emails. And this operation problem is trying to compute the distance between them. That's a geometric view of things. So the classifier sits right in between. And there is this one parallel line which passes through, which just touches this regular emails. There's another parallel line which, which touches this, uh, the spam emails. And these points are known as support vectors. OK, the geometric view of things. OK, so essentially what it's trying to do, it is trying to, it is trying to maintain what's the minimum distance between these two sets, right? I just want you to remember these three things. That whatever it is, is there. But it's trying to find out, compute the distance between these two sets. Right? And W is written as linear combination of some alphas. OK, let's see. With this description, how do we go over? So we'll, we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. Now let's go back to the original problem, the SPM problem which we wrote down. Now, so one way to write that problem which we wrote down before would be something like, you know, think about a function, L. Now we say, suppose L was something like this. It is 0 if this quantity is more than 1. Or it has some value if it is, is less than 1, right? So what did you want? You want the w so that all of this should be the, so this whole, right? So this yi into this term is more than 1. That's what you wanted. OK? Now you see, if I minimize this function, you see, what is the minimum value of this? 0. So this is all, all is positive, right? The minimum value is 0, right? When is that, when is that going to be attained? When, when they satisfy these constraints, isn't it? And then, you know, so one case could be this is 0, you know, and then this is the only term left to minimize that. That was the original problem we wrote down. So the advantage of writing, writing it in this form is there are no constraints to this. I can look at this function and you minimize this function. Okay? Now, an interesting tool for minimization is called gradient descent. That is what you do is compute the derivative of the function. Right? And then what you do is you update. So suppose you have a current value wt. And what you do is you take a small step size along the, along the derivative of the function. Okay? So here, so that's called gradient descent, right? Gradient is a derivative, and I'm descending along the, line of uh, along the line of the derivative, right? So we can show that under conditions, you know, this will, uh, you, this will find the minimum. So I've written down the formulas for this. So you can see that the derivative would depend on what? The derivative of L with respect to each of these variables, each, sorry, each of these examples, right? I equal 1 through m. Right? For each data point, I get this L function, right? I would take derivative with respect to each of the points. Fine? So, so what's the problem? Sorry. What's the problem with this, you see? This n is like a million. Right? So doing million things, so this is going to be very, very slow. Because I have to do many, many iterations of this, right? So, 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 the, so there's an interesting approach in 2007 proposed by Shai et al. What they say that what was the problem? The problem was a derivative dependent on n terms, right? One for each example. Why are you doing that? Let's be approximate that. 
Let me randomly pick up an example. Let me randomly pick up an example. Compute derivative, right? So randomly pick up, choose an example i and compute this term. So previously it was some of these things, right? So this is an approximation to the gradient. So they call it stochastic gradient descent. Fine. Why is stochastic? Because I'm randomly choosing an example. Fine. So obviously it's suited for large data sets because I randomly pick an example, update, randomly pick an example, update. You know. But the problem with this method is it exhibits high variance. You know, you can see the values fluctuating a lot. So one people found is that instead of picking one example at a time, you can you know choose a batch, you know, pick some m examples that give a little bit better result. So that is one of these basic line of research. It's still very active line of research in fact. However, in the Google kind of scenario, this is still not good enough. For example, see now as you have seen here, so all of when I asked you how many of you have Gmail accounts, all of you put up your hand, and this is going to be the case anywhere in the world. So this server sitting here in India, server sitting in Singapore, server sitting in Japan, all emails are not in one place. So, so the, I still can't run SGD like this. SGD short form of stochastic gradient descent. So what I need to do is to do di distributed gradient descent. So why, what do you mean by that? So distributed gradient descent, by that I mean is that suppose data was partitioned into, let's say, k processors. So in the first processor, uh, there's some examples. Second processor, there's some examples, and so on. So for each of the processors, you can compute maybe the gradient, let us say, if you know the W values. Let's call them G1, G2, and all that, GK. Now what do you do? So these are the workers. The workers, the processors, they, suppose you know a particular value of W. They compute the gradient, G1, G2, et cetera. And then what do they do? They send back to a manager. What the manager does, manager then averages them. This is now the gradient. And then what do they do? Then update. And then, then what is it they're going to do now? You transfer it back to the workers. And it goes on. So this is roughly this is the idea. So what's the problem here? Communication. Because one is sitting in Singapore, one other is sitting in Delhi, another is sitting in Bangalore, another sitting is I don't know where. You know? So so these workers must send all the G's values here, then you can update, and then you can send them back. So synchronization is a huge, huge issue here. So the idea is that can you do better? So, so obviously, the moment you do this parallel processing, the synchronization is an issue, right? So now, can we, so here is our, so here is where we start and say that, okay, can we do things differently? That is, can we avoid the parallelism and still solve the same kind of problems? That, so that is where we take off. So our first attempt to this aspect, uh, uh, to, for this problem is, again, a randomized procedure. So let us see that. So any questions at this point? Okay, thank you. So let's see. So here, we'll say that you're not given K processors. You are given one's machine, okay? And data is residing some external memory. You can read it up if you like, right? Obviously, I have an SVM solver, let us say, which cannot solve this big problem. It can solve a small problem, right? You're giving a one machine, which can solve a small problem, right? So what is it we, should, we, we can do? OK, so obviously, simple thing what you can do is, so again, as I said, let's revisit our SVM thing. As we talked about, right? these are, let's say, our regular emails, and these are our spam emails. Now, for now, I will ask you to pretend that as if there are a million points sitting here. You know? So I have done, I think, 13 points are here. So, so these two lines are essentially the lines we talked about before. right? These are the support vectors. And the classifier is somewhere right in the middle. Now the idea is that given this data set, you have to find these green lines. That's what you have to do. So, but I can't solve this 13, uh, this SVM with 13 problems, right? Maybe I can solve this SVM with five data points, right? So let me, what should I do? Let me randomly choose some five points. Okay. Learn an SVM on this. Fine. So what does it give me? It gives me instead of this green line, it gave me these two, these two lines, right? So these are the two points. These are support vectors now. Right? So then I check. Is it good? So what is the goodness? What is the goodness check? Does it satisfy all the constraints, right? So I find, no, by and large it's good. Oh, can you see that? There are some yellow things here. One, two, this, right? So these yellow things it got wrong. Correct? These are examples in the 
set which was not sampled. Okay, so this I will say is violators, right? So this violated. So this. So if I choose this as to my this as to my this green line. Sorry, my optimal classifier uh, lines describe the optimal classifier. These are the things which violates. So let's do something about. It. So what is it I should do? So we propose the following. What you do is you keep the earliest support vectors, which is I mean this blue colored things, and things on which you got got wrong, you made a mistake, sample from them. So what is the constraint on sampling? I can only solve an SVM of with five examples, right? So pick the remaining. So three is already there. Pick two, two more, right? So I pick randomly pick two more things here, right? And resolve SVM. Maybe I get a better estimate, right? So this is the iterative procedure, right? I sample, solve, check for violators, and then resample and solve. Go on. This is a basic procedure, right? Is it clear that this can be done in a single machine? The small solver. Okay. Now, so this is so now let's see. Can you say something more formally about this? So this idea came from linear programming. So where they wanted to solve large linear programs. So this is a linear program with so x is a decision variable, x is a so x is a variable in d dimensions, so there are d decision variables, and there are n constraints, right? This is a constraint set. So, so each row is a constraint, as you wrote down before. Now assume D is much smaller than N. That is, number of constraints is far more than the number of dimensions. Okay? You have access to a solver which can solve a problem with M constraints, not N. Okay? Let's say N is 1 million, M is like 100, D is like 10. Okay? I want to solve a 1 million problem with access to a solver which can only solve you know, 100 examples. Right? That, that's the idea. So, so, so what this was? I mean, there are many proposals. The proposals which you are interested in is interested in is given by Clarkson in 1995. So roughly, it says something like this: Suppose m was 6d square. So you take 6d square constraints randomly, solve your linear program, find the violators, resolve the the way as we talked about before. So this is an interesting procedure, right? So now, now the idea is that can we extend this to our setting? We don't have a linear program, by the way. Our objective function is not linear. So actually, this, this scheme is very general. So this can be extended to other optimization problems. But then you might ask that, OK, he, what he did was for the linear program, he said 6 d squared, where d is the number of decision variables, right? So that's the key. That's the number of constants I need to sample. OK? Now, actually, what he says is that, so this number of so this d is related to an interesting quantity called the commutatorial dimension of the problem for a linear programming what is what does it mean now the optimal solution x is, d, is a d dimension vector right and all of you know that 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 can be described by d independent vectors right so if maybe maybe in the constraint set there exists some d constraints if you can find them if you can find them, it will describe the optimal point. I don't need I, I can ignore all the other points. But the problem is I do not know them. That's the problem. What, so what Clarkson's scheme says is that if you take 6d square, you know, it's a good probability you will hit it after some time. You'll hit that particular set. And that's the way it works. Right? Of course, as you see, you know, uh, this is very uh, like this is quite a complicated theory, but I'm trying to give you the overview of this. So now in our case, we need to find what is this delta? What is this commutatorial dimension? Right? Remember. So, in this case, in linear programming case, what was delta? It was the optimal solution was described by d dimension vector. Right? That's what you. That that's what you found, right? In our case, what is, what is what should we do? We need to find, as we saw before, no w is a linear combination of this alpha y i x i, right? Now, the key idea is as follows. So, so in a three-dimension space, right? Okay. Sorry, I was sure. Okay, maybe we will do this. Okay. So, in a in a let's say in two-dimension space, right? How many points do you require to draw a line? Two, correct. 
And SVM, what do we do? We're doing parallel lines, right? So how many points would you require to draw a parallel line? Three. Parallel line, right? Slope is already fixed, right? I just need, need to know intercept. So obviously, so delta for this in our case would be d plus one, like an upper bound. Okay, so that's the idea. So now, so so in more formally, delta is the minimum number of support vectors. So this was proved by Balcazar et al. So then, what you can do is you can you can iterate over this six delta square. Now I find so delta is d plus one, right? And what is d for us? Of interest. 10 power 6. So this, so this is not going to work. Correct? This is not going to work. 10 power 6 double square is not going to help. So you'll do something else. Right? So what, how does it help? So there is a very interesting theorem. Please ignore this mathematically ugly statement. In simple words, there's a theorem which Professor Ravi Kandan introduced in the first lecture called Johnson Linnaeus theorem. So essentially it says the following. If you have m points in a d-dimensional space, right? You can project the points down in a log m dimensional space, and still the distances will be roughly preserved. So the 100 points in a dimensional space, right? So I can still project it down to log 100 dimensional space, and roughly the distances, if that's what you have interest, if that's what is of interest to you, that will still be roughly preserved. And what is the SVM thing doing now? You know, as you said, this distance between these two points, no? I can project it down to log n dimension space, right, using this theorem. So obviously, so that's the thing. So by random projection, right? So let's not ask what is that. So, so essentially, we can say, now, OK, SVMs, if you project it down in log, log m dimensional space, the distance will roughly be preserved. So what is the delta now? Delta is log m. So n was 10 power 6, like log m is a much more small number. And now, so I can run this with c log n square points and solve an SVM, go and use the same Clarkson type scheme. So you, you can prove after this that high probability we will get the problem, the optimal solution of this. I think I'm out of time, so I will stop here. I'm sorry I couldn't complete that. And I'll take questions now. So we have time, some time for questions. Hi, Professor. Uh, you, you did mention that in the Clarkson's uh, uh, hypothesis of finding, you said that uh, it's six d squares a bound mm. for finding an optimal thing when the objective function is linear. You also said that the objective function in this case, where we are trying to solve, is nonlinear. Mm. So, did that uh, analogy or hypothesis extend to the nonlinear space as well? Yes, yes. That there's a comment I made. So here, the, so there d was the dimension of the problem. So now it will abstract to a more general class of problems, which Clarkson defines as abstract AO optimization problems called AOP. For that, the analogy is you need to find out the delta, the combinatorial dimension of the problem. So it will, will apply to many convex problems for that matter. And delta in our case turns out to be d plus 1, as, we, as, as I was trying to argue. This is probably very basic. So, uh, if I understood it's correct, so you're trying to find an efficient uh, way of computing the W and the B. So, how difficult it is to com find the r good set of x, I mean the x vector, and even the form of that uh, fx, right? I mean, I mean, I can give any vector x, right? So, I mean, those x1, x2, x3. So, those features that you mentioned. Yes. So how difficult is it to come up with a good set of features for that? No, no. So in this, in this place, in, in this, in this uh, talk, we assume that the features are given. So obviously, this, this features are hand-coded by system engineers for the email, for the spam thing. Okay. Right? This will assume is given. But the problem they have is they do not know how to describe spam. So what they will do is do all kinds of things. You know? So that becomes a huge feature list, 10 power 6. So in general, how difficult it might be to get a good set of vectors or even the function that you have? See, now we, we are assuming that if somebody else has given the feature set. Now that would depend on the knowledge of the particular problem. So for example, if somebody wants to classify music, you know, they'll have to have some, so you have to go to the music experts who, and they'll give you the features.
Uh, in SVM, something called kernel trick is there. Mm. So, uh, in that case, how is this Clarkson theorem is going to behave? I mean, how is that bound is this going is, to? So, this will apl also apply to the um, uh, to the kernel case. Because in that case, the delta will also change. I mean. Uh, so obviously, so now delta depends on uh, log n. Log n. Yeah. What is n? Uh, I mean, it's number of examples. Number of examples. Correct. Does it depend on data dimension? Oh. Uh, yeah. So you set up. Right. So, just selection techniques like something considering like deep learning and all those stuff. How does it impact when it comes to a uh, given set of features? How do how does that perform? So, is your question that if I do feature selection, like how on the uh, so at this point, I am I am. There's no. I mean, I don't have clarity, and I think research community doesn't have clarity is how good that work. But in practice, it works well. So the key for this kind of research is that you also need to give guarantees. right? And I can give you a guarantee, as I said, I've already enforced that I can give you a guarantee that this algorithm will converge to the right solution. So deep learning, one of the main, main problems in deep learning is it doesn't give you guarantees as of today. Okay. But having said that, it empirically is showing very good performance. Yeah. So at this point, we do not know yet if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, maybe that's what the state of the art is, okay. I guess. Uh, so please tell us your yeah please tell us your name and also organization. I'm I'm Shrikant Ayer from IAC. So uh, after you do the first round of uh, and you find the violators, mm -hmm. uh, is it uh, can we do better than random sampling because you know how no, the yeah. Vi yeah. So what Clarkson scheme does it it doubles the weight on the violators. So also the violators you can find the distance from these uh, parallel lines that you have. So if something is uh, violating very badly, maybe you may want to give it, or is there, is there some such thing? Okay, so only study I know is, or the Clarkson scheme is, what it does it, it starts with a basic all weights are equal, right? If it violates, you just double the weight. And that's the way they develop the algorithm. But uh, what you are saying can also be explored, but, I, but there's no study like that. I think it would be a good thing to do. So I'm Kunal Sharma from Ernst and Young. Okay. Uh, my question is uh, a very basic. It has to do something with the selection of violators mm. for the random sampling. Okay. So if uh, are there chances that an initially uh, a point which has it which was initially selected, let's say in the first or the second iteration, mm. is later on removed from the set and you know cycles back to becoming one of the violators later on? So the probability would be pretty low. But there's a non-zero probability of this yeah. going into a cycling kind of right, a right. situation? So, um, okay, so I think the Clarkson scheme, uh, yeah, I would say the probability would be very low for that. You can also see, tell, tell us your name. I'm Kunal Sharma. Uh -huh. Then one question here, and then there is one more question there. You had a question, yeah? Huh. Yeah, you, you can. I am Rishi from IBM. So in this uh, last part, mm. do you actually have to do the dimensionality reduction explicitly or you can just do this sampling without actually doing the dimensionality? We don't have to. We don't have to. We don't have to. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. We don't have to. But we, so, and we don't do it actually. So that's why it works for the kernel case also. Yeah, we just need to, it's a thought experiment to get the proof go through. So we have time for just one final question. I'm Ashish from Mindtree. Uh, my question is very stupid. You open a Gmail account, mm. don't give it to anybody. You open a corporate account, don't give it to anybody. You will get okay. spam in your Gmail. You will not get in your corporate account. You open a new email mm. at the okay. rate IAC. Okay. Okay. For example, you open a Gmail account, don't give it to anybody. You will okay. still get spam in your Gmail account. It will get spam in your Gmail account. But so you will not get in corporate so account. So maybe, okay. So you can take, take it up with Google, I guess. <laughs> 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 no, I, was, I was joking. So, so I do not know. I do not know what. See, the, here's the, here's a comment I made about the privacy issues. I do not know what Google. So maybe it's in a service contract that Google uh, not allowed to read corporate emails. I do not know. So obviously, you see, the other point I wanted to I certainly stressed was that you have to understand the email. So you're reading it. Or the machine reads it. Somebody else reads it. You're reading it. So I'm not sure. The, maybe I'm not sure. Maybe corporations have a you know a clause that you are not allowed to read my emails. In that case, but anyway, you can maybe ask Google about that. Okay, I think let's thank uh, Professor Chiranjeev for a very engaging <laughs> and an excellent talk.
on behalf of all of you, I would like to present this T-shirt to Chiru. Thank you. I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Jayant Haritsa to you. He's going to give the next talk. All that I can say about uh, Jayant is that he's a jewel of CSA and SCRC. That sort of sums up uh, Jayant. After finishing his B.Tech uh, at IIT Madras and a PhD at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Professor Jayant is currently one of the foremost researchers in the design, analysis, and testing of database systems. He is highly decorated. Uh, he is a fellow of uh, IEEE. He is a distinguished member of ACM. He is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences. He is a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences. He is a fellow of the Indian National Academy of Engineering. And he is currently the only Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award winner in the entire Division of Electrical Sciences. And more recently, he was also, he is also a recipient of the IIT Madras Distinguished Alumnus Award. In addition to writing a very large number of influential papers in the area of database systems which are extensively cited, uh, Professor Jayant more recently has also been uh, coming up with tools. And uh, for example, the tool which is uh, very aptly called Picasso uh, is, a, is, a, is a tool for testing the efficiency of uh, query engines in database systems. And it turns out that it got the best demo award in the uh, very prestigious VLDB conference. And one of the most more recent tools that he has built is called COD, which again has been named after one of the celebrated researchers in database systems. So today, he will be talking to us about big data and small testing. Let's welcome Professor Jayant and invite him to give his talk. Thank you. Uh, is this audible at the back? Okay. So thank you for the excessively kind uh, introduction and good afternoon to all of you. So as all of you are only too well aware, okay, big data has become the, especially in recent years, the buzzword of choice in the software industry. And as is testified to by this initiative, the academic research community has also started tagging along. But if you will permit me, to inject a much needed dose of realism and caution into this frenetic hoopla that's surrounding this uh, uh, supposedly new concept or this new fad, I would like to start by exploding a few myths about big data. The first is that it's not a new concept. It's an old concept propelled by a new burst of hype. And to validate my claim, for over 40 years, we have had a very well-known conference, which Professor Natari already alluded to, which is called as VLDB, which is the premier international database conference. And VLDB expands to very large database. I did some linguistic analysis and found that at the, f with the, at the first degree of approximation, large is approximately equal to big, which then proves <laughs> that very large is much bigger than big. And you can do this without Google Translate. <laughs> so the second myth is that everybody and their grandmother nowadays think, I have big data. That's not true at all. There are only a few enterprises, and those enterprises know who they are. That's the CIA and a few other companies who really have big data. The rest of them just say so for bragging rights, just like the six-pack apps and so. <laughs> so even if you look at a very well-respected site in Germany, which is the World Data Center for Climate, which is considered to be one of the largest curated databases in the world. In fact, currently it's at position number one. It just has about one petabyte of operational data. So at this point, you might wonder, saying that, look at the previous talk that Chiru gave, and then he said that there were 200 gigabytes of data coming in daily from the Sloan Sky server. How do these two reconcile together? Perhaps the reason is that most of space is full of black holes. There's nothing there. So the 200 GB has nothing in it. Okay. I'd also like to point you to a recent New York Times op-ed article, which came out last month. And this is by two faculty in the New York University, where they talk about a variety of problems with big data. 
And perhaps the most important one there is that big data is prone to giving scientific sounding solutions to hopelessly imprecise questions. Okay? And the reason for their anguish here was a recent book that was published by authors from MIT and Google. And the title of the book is, Who's Bigger? Where do historical figures really rank? And the goal here was to say that, let's take all the uh, uh, great personalities in the world and let's try to rank order them as to who are the people who had the most impact or more impact than the others in terms of their uh, global uh, perception in the world. And they did this by looking at millions of documents all over the world. And what they got was that Hitler ranks higher than Aristotle. Okay. So as you can see, you can get all kinds of ridiculous answers from big data. Okay. So it's important that we in the academic community need to ensure that big data does not wind up becoming huge nonsense. So now that I have successfully made the organizers thoroughly regret the fact that they invited me to give this <laughs> talk, okay. let me come to the main thrust of my uh, uh, presentation. And that is, let's look at the research landscape. The current focus, and you have seen this in many of the talks in this series, is that everybody wants to work on architecting the core plumbing infrastructure for big data environments. And these cover the entire spectrum from programming models to stream processing, data summarization, sketching and approximation algorithms, storage architectures, and then how do you uh, host uh, uh, big data uh, enterprises on the cloud. And then, of course, an, uh, big data analytics is a cottage industry. You've already seen some talks on that in the uh, series so far. Arnab gave a talk on clustering. Today we had one on classification and so on. And then security is, of course, always a perennial concern. Okay. But at the risk of starting a mini riot here, let me let you in on a big secret. None of these techniques are going to work. Okay. And the reason that they're not going to work is that they're technically very sound. They have the JL theorem behind them. Everything works perfectly. Okay. But they won't work in practice. Okay. And the reason is that there is an elephant in the room. And what is the elephant? The elephant is the lack of testing methodologies for such deployments. So you might say, well, okay, why are you just being a prophet of gloom and doom? Okay? Is this really the case? We have, everybody has been talking about success stories here of big data and so on. We are all celebrating this. In fact, a few days back, I saw one of the local IT buses having big data on the side of it emblazoned. Okay? It's right in front of you. Okay? So let's be positive and so on. To negate that, instead of talking about success stories, let me talk about two big data disasters. Okay? And these are not ancient history. Both of them happened in the last year. Both of them happened with public services. And one was in the UK, and the other was in the US. Okay? The first one in Britain was that, as you know, they periodically have these bouts of xenophobic uh, uh, nationalism, where they just want to throw out all the Asian-looking people. They went through this exercise last year once. Okay? And what happened was that, they sent in letters to people whom they suspected were illegal uh, immigrants. And what they found is that several people who had been legitimate citizens for a long time also received these letters in error. So then what they said is that, oh, the right way to solve this problem is to give it to the IT industry. So the government ministers commissioned Capita, which is this well-known outsourcing company, to say that, why don't you guys go and trace the people who have outstayed their visas and send them these nasty letters. Okay. Guess what? In a few months, Capita itself was accused of even be being worse than the bureaucrats. Okay? Because it got just as mixed up as the, uh, uh, as the bureaucrats with whom it was supposed to be replacing. And in fact, last November, they admitted they had a huge backlog of around 150,000 letters. So not only are they not, send, uh, not sending letters to the wrong people, they're not even able to create the letters in the first place. Okay? And this is uh, 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 the uh, uh, final uh, kind of summary, this is from an article in the Guardian newspaper. It says in IT terms, it's been at the center of a billion dollar botched e-border system, missing deadlines and delivery dates since the middle of the last millennium. And what is, I thought was really funny was that it may not even be legal under the EU legislation. Okay, so this is as far as the Britain goes. Okay. Let's move on to Obama who has already talked about saying he won his election because of big data. It's very likely he will lose his term because of big data again. Okay. <laughs> And the classic example of this happened on October 1st of last year when he unveiled his 
uh, much wanted healthcare portal where people were able to, uh, this was like a marketplace where you were able to buy uh, uh, private insurance. Right? On the very first day itself, the site became unusable. And at that time, the claim uh, reason was that saying, well, look, we just expected that around 50,000 odd people would uh, 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 sign up for the system. But what we found is that the number of hits to the website was much in excess of that, about five times more. About 250,000 people came over here. But within a few days, they actually had to admit that it was not just an issue of volume, but actually involved core software and system design issues. And then here is the kicker. They had stress test done on the system by the contractors, and all of these contractors are the IT companies being paid millions of dollars and so on for doing this work. It was done one day before the launch date. That is on September 30th. Okay. And that stress test had actually said that the, forget 50,000. If you have more than 1,000 users, the site becomes unusable. Okay. Now you might say, okay, maybe there was a tiny glitch somewhere and everything will get fixed in a day, a day or two. Actually, that's not the case. This portal, the problems persisted even weeks after the launch. After some time, they had a networking error on the uh, data services hub and this killed the website again. And what was ironic and as often happens in such cases is that this happened the, exactly the next day after the Health and Human Services Secretary, Kathleen Sabelius, had highlighted that designing this data hub was a huge government success. <laughs> and I think those of, you, those of you who are following the US politics would know that uh, uh, Kathleen Sebelius uh, recently resigned as the uh, uh, secretary. And a large part of it was due to the fact that she had gotten uh, a heavy dose of criticism for the mishandling of uh, this particular portal. <laughs> OK. So you might be wondering, OK, we have all this. Uh, uh, fantastic software industry which is touted all over the world. How can they make such egregious errors and such basic things that they could not even uh, uh, find out before the deployment of the system? Okay. So the problem here is the mindset. Okay. Everybody, that includes all of you, loves writing code. And equally everybody, includes all of you, <laughs> hates testing it. So we all want to come up with new ideas and new uh, techniques and new ways of reducing the uh, dimensionality of a problem and so on. But we don't want to evaluate the current setups. Okay? And this is something that has been taken as an article of faith in India. Every time you have an academic institution which is in trouble, what do you do? You don't fix it. You create a new institution. Right? That's exactly what is being done here, saying, I don't want to go and debug this stuff okay, because it's a pain. Let me go and do something else. Okay? So what is the only solution given this mindset? You have to automate the sys testing. And that is, can be done because A, computers are cheap. And B, unlike pampered software engineers, they do not complain. Okay. So now, what I would claim is that, just like all the other important problems in computer science, test automation is also a database problem. Okay. Because the core of it is logical data independence, which is the bedrock on which all database systems are founded. And thankfully for us, it's a far cry from being solved. So we have lots of research challenges to address. Now, some of you might be wondering, saying that the current impression, especially amongst the students here or people who are joining the industry, is that only the losers go to the testing groups. Because that's the worst assignment you could have. It's a hardship assignment. I would like to work in the different groups. Testing is, the, is, is something that is reserved for the people who don't do too well. Okay. But my claim is that maybe doing the testing itself is boring. But if you do research on testing methodologies, that's actually great fun. Because you have a variety of interesting intellectual problems. And I'll show you a few of them in the remaining slides. And here is the bonus and or the icing on the cake is that they have immediate practical impact. Okay. And these problems. Uh, cover the entire spectrum of computer science from complexity theory to efficient algorithms, cute data structures, realistic experiments, and uh, uh, proof of concept prototypes. Okay. So if you're interested in this kind of, uh, 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 these kinds of problems, you might want to look at the special issue of the IEEE Data Engineering Bulletin, which came out a few years ago, on the testing and tuning of database systems, which covers various problems that cover these kinds of uh, 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 aspects of computer science. So here is a, a few of instances of those uh, problems. Okay. For example, suppose you had a large workload of test queries to your database. Okay. Obviously, you cannot execute all of them. How do you do a summarization into a small set that provides an equivalent coverage? Okay. This was handled in Sigma 2002. This, was ex this is extremely important for those 
uh, 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 database systems where you would like to do automatic index selection. So this is the physical schema in the database as opposed to the logical schema. You want to do automatic in index selection and also for workload-based sampling. You can show that this problem is hard from a reduction from the k-median problem, but you can come up with constant factor approximations for metric spaces here. Similarly, there's a very interesting problem which occurred two years ago where you said that you would like to retain certain kinds of data characteristics even in outsourced data processing. So typically, when you outsource the data processing, you encrypt the data because you don't want people looking at the stuff. But once you do encryption, it means that all the mistakes in the original data are now hidden because you cannot distinguish between the encryption and the mistake. Okay? And often, you want to retain the data quality problems. So this looks paradoxical, but here, when you do the outsourcing, you want to retain the problems of missing data in correct format and so on, even in the encrypted customer data. So how do you encrypt it without, uh, at the same time, obfuscating the, uh, uh, the, the problems that are there in the data? Yet another problem in a similar vein is that, suppose you have a database D, and you have some kind of a parameterized query Q, where there are certain uh, uh, filter predicates, and the predicates have constants that can be varied. Okay? And then you have cardinality constraints on the sub-expressions. How do you assign parameter values to Q such that they satisfy these constraints? Okay? This problem was again addressed about a decade ago. You can show again that it's a hard problem from a reduction from subset sum, but there's a hill climbing heuristic that works pretty well. And then there is my favorite problem, which is called reverse query processing, which came out of ETH Zurich about uh, six years ago. Here, it turns the entire database problem on its head. What it says is that given a query Q on some logical database schema D, and then you know the answer that you want, which is R, now generate the database instance D such that when this query Q is executed on D, you get R. And ideally, you want the smallest size database that satisfies the property. And this is very important for the testing process because it only then can you ensure that you can get meaningful and non-zero results. Otherwise, most testing uh, 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 environments, what you find is that the kinds of queries that you're giving finally wind up with coming up with null answers. Okay. So here you can make sure that the result that you have is exactly what you wanted, and therefore you can ensure that they are not in this trivial characteristic of having null answers or having the right characteristics with regard to the kind of distribution of data. What is interesting here is forget whether there is a D that exists or not. It's even undecidable whether such a D even exists. But using some techniques from model checking, symbolic processing, and something called reverse relational algebra. Most of you would have seen the relation, relational algebra, which is first order logic in databases. This is reverse relational algebra. You can actually come up with fairly good solutions. So if you look at this in what is called as a trichotomy, you have queries, you have a database, and you have answers. Okay? The traditional way of looking at this is that you input the queries, apply it on the database, and you get the answers. But in reverse query processing, you turn this on the head. You say, I know the answers. I know the questions. Supply me the database. And then you can have the third case where you say that, I know the answers. I have the database. You supply the questions instead. Okay? So this is called programming by example. Okay. Okay, now let's look at what is happening with regard to this testing in uh, the database world. The basic problem here is that, how do you know that the output which is delivered to you is correct? Okay? For Programs in most other fields, it becomes easy to check because you have boundary conditions and so on. But often in databases, you get a ton of data back. Okay? You literally have big, not just big data, but big results. You get a million rows in, re in return. Okay? Then the checking is hard because of the magnitude of data that's involved and the complexity of the queries. So in fact, what people have found is that the problem starts at the very beginning. At the time that you translate from what your manager told you in English to SQL, the mistake starts right there. Okay? Give you a simple example. This was an actual headline that came out in the Indian Express about uh, uh, six or seven years ago. And the headline is, Public Demands Change. Okay? So those of you who are ARP enthusiasts would probably think that, well, what he's meaning is that either the public is demanding change in society, okay, or that the public demands themselves are changing over time. Okay, this is the uh, uh, interpretation that we would make. But actually, it's much more mundane. All that this guy is asking for is, public is demanding loose change. <laughs> So in the real world, they have found this to be a big problem. Only 40% of the SQL queries are correct, in the correct in the sense that they are matching with what was expected by the person who gave this query in the first place in some natural language format, and they asked something, and you did something completely different. Okay? 
And then even after you're told that you're wrong, it often takes you several iterations to get it right. You can also have errors which are like the syntactic errors where you make mistakes even in typing. Yeah. Most uh, 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 people who have had an education in India have a great difficulty with spelling and semicolons and so on. Yeah. But this is easy to check with automatic parser generators. You can also have semantic errors where there are either errors in terms of the schema itself or in the type information and so on. But this is easy to check from the catalogs, which is the metadata in the database. Arithmetic errors like division by zero and so on are also easy to check at runtime. But there's a whole class of other errors which are listed here, which are extremely hard to find. So some of these are like the rewriting errors. So the database query optimizer, what does it do? It takes the query that you wrote in such a horrible manner and tries to rewrite it into some uh, 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 reasonably efficient uh, 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 equivalent that can then be efficiently executed. Okay? But often this rewriting can be flawed in the sense that it may not retain the semantics of what you had originally given. Okay? There could also be errors in the implementations of the operators within the database system. So things like the, uh, 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 the join operators or the group buys or the aggregates and so on. There could be errors in the maintenance of the physical schema in the form of indexes. And horror of horrors, there could be also errors in the transaction management. Okay? People discovered a bug in the Aries uh, 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 transaction management algorithm, which was considered, uh, which is actually used now pretty much in all the databases in the world. Okay? So they found that if a certain kind of uh, situation occurred during the checkpointing process, then you can actually result in a situation where you don't have transactional consistency. Okay? So these are much harder to find. So what do you do? Current approach typically is that you have a set of test libraries, which are designed by either engine developers, or as Chiru was saying, how you dis uh, find the features. In the same way, you have some application specialists who know which are the things to be tested, and then you done, run regression tests on this workload. But the problem obviously here is that the coverage is very limited. So Microsoft about a decade ago tried out a very different approach, which is to say that let's instead not trust this small limited set of queries. Let's instead have stochastic generation of SQL queries, where you get all kinds of really ugly looking SQL queries with lots of different predicates being added on, and then let's run it on the system. But the problem is A, firstly it's highly expensive on real databases because you have these massive queries doing nothing. Then often what you'll find is that the answers that you get are the null, because most of the predicates nullify each other. They won't catch the boundary value errors, things that are happening on the boundaries of, uh, uh, of the uh, value domain. And you also have correlated random variables because there's a huge number of them being used in this process. Okay? So if this is the problem with regular databases, what happens to the big, big data world? Here the infrastructure is much more complicated. Now it's not just a database, but you have a hybrid of what is called as ETL, that's extract, transform, and load, which is basically a data cleaning exercise. Then there's information retrieval, knowledge management, and databases here. So take a product like IBM's Infosphere, which is a fairly big player in the big data market. They have several stages, starting from the initial data sourcing stage, then there's a quality checking stage, then there's a master data management, then you come to the actual relational database DB2, then there is Big Insights, which is their analytics engine on uh, big data, there's a metadata repository, and so on. And on all of this, what you need to do is to test the functionality, the basic functionality of the programs. Then you also need to be able to check the strategies that are being evolved for either executing the queries or for developing the models. And then once you have made up the strategies, you need to actually test the processing of the queries or the models. So there's a lot of work to be done to even to verify whether what you're doing is right or not. So as I said, the problem with big data is not that you don't get results. The problem is that you will get results. And most often than not, you'll get the wrong results. So let's take a sample scenario. You want to test a futuristic world where there are yotto bytes of data, 10 to the power of 24 doesn't exist today, but you want to try out your system. And you want to try this out for InfoSphere on all the usual metrics like functionality, correctness, performance, scalability, and so on. But see the problem here. It's completely impractical in terms of both time and space to explicitly create this 10 to the power of 24 bytes of data and then to run it through your system. And especially even if you are able to do it once, that's pretty much it, because if you have to do this repeatedly, then as you can see, this is going to kill you, because you'll spend all your time testing and you'll never create anything in the first place. Right? So this is completely infeasible to do so. So what is our holy grail? We would like to come up with a complete testing environment wherein the entire data and the metadata is virtual or transient. It never exists really. Okay? So this is big virtual data, okay, or transient data. 
This can support efficient evaluation of arbitrary deployment scenarios. So to this end, I'll talk about one specific aspect which we have worked on for the last uh, couple of years, and that is with regard to metadata testing. Yeah. So our goal here is that, can you build metadata construction tools that will fool the underlying information systems into thinking that this data is actually present even though it had never been created or stored. Okay? So this is like the slower ball in cricket. Right? You think he's going to bowl fast, it actually is a slower ball and so on, so you want to fool the system here. Okay? And for this purpose, we have developed a tool called COD. Okay? This expands to constructing dataless databases. This sounds like heresy for a database person to say. Okay? But at the same time, it's very useful for testing such deployments. The name also has a nice coincidence with, as Narhari already mentioned, with Ted Cord from IBM, who was the father of the relational database technology and was a 1981 Turing awardee. Okay? And then in Old English, Cord also happens to be in an empty shell, which exactly fits our situation here because we have a metadata shell which is completely devoid of any data within it. So we have a Yottobyte shell, but there's no real data within it. So the current status is that this is a graphical tool for the automated handling of database metadata configurations through its entire life cycle. This is written in Java. Students claim that there's about 50,000 lines of code. They add a few thousand lines every time I meet them. Okay? So we'll <laughs> assume that there's something of this order. It's operational on all the well-known industrial strength database engines, including IBM's DB2, Oracle, uh, SQL Server from Microsoft, SQL MX from HP, and so on. So currently, it's released as free software after getting a copyright from the Indian government. And then it's at use at several industrial and academic research labs. Yeah. So let's see what it can actually do. The first thing is that here you can type in the metadata directly without having any backend data to support this uh, construction. So you can go and, for example, look at the different abstractions that are present in a database. For example, you have a set of tables in a relational system. You can go and talk about the number of rows in the table and the number of columns. Okay? That's what you can see here. You can also talk about the number of disk blocks that are occupied by this particular relation. None of it exists, but you can just go and put those entries there. Okay? For each of the columns, you can also specify the number of distinct values that are present there, as well as the frequency distribution of these values in the form of histograms. You can also specify the physical schema in the form of uh, B3 indexes, the number of leaf blocks, and the clustering factor, and so on. And in fact, you can also talk about the hardware in terms of the system parameters, where you can specify the number of cores, how much memory you are, you are having, and what is the CPU utilization, and so on. Okay? All this is in the abstract world. There is no reality behind it. Okay? So on your small laptop, you could pretend that you have a blue jean machine. So here is an example of a screenshot from the tool. And if there's time at the end, I'll just uh, show you a small demo of uh, code in action. Okay? So here is a fre frequency histogram of uh, uh, attribute called the account balance of the supplier. So here are the frequencies, and here are the bucket boundaries here. Okay. Now here is where we come up with some new problems. Normally, when a database system creates metadata, that is data about the data that it has, it looks at the actual data and creates this metadata. So it infers it from this. Okay? But now, we are doing this in a vacuum, which means that I can enter arbitrary numbers. And it's possible that I'll enter illegal numbers. For example, I'll say that my database table has minus 100 rows, okay, which is clearly impossible. Or I would say that the number of entries in my index is larger than the number of rows that I have, which is, again, clearly impossible. Okay. So you need to be able to check that the information that's input is A, legal, in terms of being of the valid type and the range. And you also need to make sure it's consistent with all the other metadata values that already entered. This does not have to be done by a regular database system because we're dealing with a real life database. Here we need to make sure that whatever virtual database we're creating is also technically legal. So for this, we have a validation approach. So you constructed, you constructed a, a, a constraint graph. And in this constraint graph, the nodes of the graph are the individual metadata entities. And I'll show you an example of this in the next slide. While the edges are the set of statistical dependencies between these various metadata entities. And then since it's easily possible for the number of nodes here to blow up to be a very large number, we also have what are called as super nodes that essentially collapse certain set of nodes for compactness. Now, once you create this constrained graph, you can run a topological sort on this graph to obtain a linearization of it. And then what we do is that 
we insist that the user enter all the metadata values using exactly the same linear ordering. Because then I can keep checking at every stage whether it is in conformance, both legally as well as consistently, with regard to the previous values that were entered here. So here is an example that comes from IBM's uh, uh, DB2 engine. And what you see is that all these boxes here are the nodes and the arrows. So these are the uh, nodes of the constraint graph. And all the arrows represent the statistical dependencies. So for the nodes, you have associated uh, uh, legality constraints. So for example, the card talks about the cardinality or the number of rows in the table. So this is for the tables uh, metadata here. So it tells you that the number of rows should be greater than 0. Or the only other possibility is minus 1. Minus 1 means I didn't bother to check how many rows there were. Okay? But you cannot have a minus 100 here, for example. Okay? Similarly, if you look at uh, uh, the uh, various uh, information that you have here, this talks about the attribute level information. So this is about columns, whereas this is about relations. And what we are talking about here, for example, is saying that if you look at the number of null values in a certain column, and if you look at the number of actual legal values within the column, the sum of those two values should be less than the cardinality of the relation. That is, the total number of distinct uh, uh, values in the uh, uh, column that you have should be less than the number of rows in your table. Okay? So these are all fairly obvious constraints, but need to be specified here, because otherwise there will be complete mayhem, in the sense that you will be creating illegal databases here. Okay? So here is the constraint that shows this, that these two edges basically ensure that this combination has to be less than this. Similarly, there is a, a, a dependency here which says that the cardinality of the index should be less than the cardinality of the relation here because it only talks about the unique values, whereas this talks about all the possible values in the domain. So you can basically construct this graph here. And then what we also found is that we actually discovered some new missing constraints that had not been realized by the designers of these systems uh, before. Okay? So some of these dashed edges represent such missing constraints. Okay? And then you have these various numbers here, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. This tells you the topological sort on the constraint graph. And this is how the users need to enter the information. And the basic uh, paradigm that you follow here is that you go from higher levels of abstraction, like the relations, to lower levels, like the attributes, and then the indexes, and so on. Okay. Okay. Another very uh, uh, unique feature of the COD uh, uh, system is that there are many database systems that al already allow you to do space-based scaling. That is to say that if you had 100 GB, I'll make it 1 terabyte by basically increasing the number of rows in the relations in the database. But nobody has as yet looked at this problem of time-based scaling. And what we mean by that is that you have a certain metadata in your database for which if you are executing some query workload on this metadata, the expectation is that it will take some amount of time to execute all these queries here. Now what we want to do is to scale this metadata. So for example, this could also increase, uh, result in increasing the number of rows in a relation, maybe increasing number of columns, and so on, is that you would like it to be a specified multiple of the cost of executing it on the original metadata. So the motivation here is that in future, space will never be an issue. Okay? Because today, virtually, space is free. Okay? If you go and uh, uh, go to the Prakruti um, uh, uh, coffee center here, instead of loose change, it will give you a hard disk nowadays. Right? So space is completely free, but time is not free. Okay? And because time is not free, you would like to do time-based scaling, where you say that, OK, I was testing it with this workload. I want a new workload to test it for 10 hours more. I don't care how you design the space for this, but just make sure that it does finishes within time. Okay? So the initial attempt that you would make here would be to say that, let me generate this new metadata that is the scaled version, such that the cost of every individual query within this workload is scaled by this factor alpha. And what you can easily do is to show that this is fundamentally impossible to do. Okay? That is, in trying to create an environment where one of the queries is scaled up by alpha, it is necessarily the case that somebody else would suffer and would not be scaled by the same factor. Okay? So instead, what we do is that in uh, Chiru style, we cast it as an optimization problem. And we say that you would like to produce a scaled version of the metadata such that the sum over this workload of the deviations from alpha is minimized subject to the constraint that the overall cost of this workload is scaled by alpha, okay, which is kind of uh, written here. And this is not an easy problem, again, because there's a complex relationship between the cost of the query execution and the scaling factors that makes this problem hard. But to our help, we can get a few lemmas. There's one is a scaling lemma. Okay, so I won't go through the details here. I'll just give you the high-level picture. And the scaling lemma basically tells you that 
if you had different scaling factors for each of the tables in your database, what is the impact on the output cardinality of each of the operators that are within your plant trees? Okay? That is what is essentially mentioned here. And apart from the scaling lemma, there's also a bounding lemma which tells you what is the uh, different scaling factors, the range of values that these different scaling factors for each of the individual relations can assume. And there are certain legality constraints here. Okay? So if you use both of this, then you now have a time scaling algorithm where from the original execution plan of the database query optimizer, you come up with some cost for executing this query on the original database. Now using this first uh, scaling lemma, you can figure out what is going to be the cost on the scaled version as an algebraic function of the scaling factors which are listed here. Then you solve the optimization problem subject to the bounding lemma. If you get a set of solutions, pick the solution that minimizes this particular uh, metric here. Okay. And then you can finally go and actually scale all the input uh, uh, database relations with the scaling factors that are obtained from here. Okay. okay. So to give you a, a high level uh, a recap of what the special features of COD are, firstly it creates arbitrary what if scenarios. Okay. And I'll show you some examples of this to wind up the talk. It does automatic validation of the user input to make sure that you are creating databases that could have existed in the real world. For the first time, it supports not just space-based scaling, but also time-based scaling, okay, which as I said, is going to be much more important in the future than space-based scaling. It provides graphical histogram operations, and it also allows you to transfer the metadata from one database engine to another. Okay. So here is an example of where it actually worked. Okay. So we tried to simulate this Yottabyte environment on one of the well-known commercial database systems, and we found that the query optimizer crashed. Okay. Now, the problem here is that this would never have been discovered unless you had actually had a Yottabyte environment and then run it through the system. And so you created this huge Yottabyte database and then said, oh, great query uh, optimizer, go and try to figure out the execution plan for this query, and then you would have found that the system would have crashed. But here we could find this without ever having created this data. Okay. So when we simulated this, where the database query optimizer was fooled into thinking this data was present, it actually crashed. And then what we found out is the reason this had happened was that at the time the software was being created by the original vendor, somebody had put in a large constant. And the large constant for them at that time was 10 to the power of 20. They said, who would ever in their right mind have databases large than 10 to the power of 20? Okay. Obviously, they had not heard of big data at that time. Okay. So they had put in this magic constant and had not documented it anywhere. So this was a hidden constant saying, this is the end of life. Hopefully, the world will end before we come to 10 power of 20. Right? But this bug could be discovered with absolutely no effort by us. You did not have to create the 10 to the power of 20 or 24 database. You did not have to try out anything complex. In just the abstract shell world, you could figure out this problem. Okay? Another example of this is that there is a well-known benchmark in the database community which helps you to compare different vendors' uh, uh, offerings of database engines. That is called the TPCH benchmark. Okay? Now, let's say you wanted to look at the TPCH benchmark, both at its baseline size, which is just a minuscule 1 GB, and you, you're a little more ambitious now. You also want to say, how does the database system behave when you increase the scale to 100 terabytes? Okay? Obviously, you want to, don't want to go through the process of creating this in the first place, okay? because you're going to put your thesis at risk, because this will never complete. Okay? You can create both of them just using metadata shells in a few minutes of time. Now you say that, look, I only have a laptop with a 64 gigabyte disk. Okay? Obviously, it cannot hold this kind of data. But remember, we are only holding the shell. The metadata is very small. It's just a few lines. The actual database never existed. And then you want to try, out, try this out on a commercial database system. So let's say you tried this out on query 9 of the benchmark. The benchmark has 22 different queries. And this is one SQL query. So for those of you who cannot parse this in real time, all that it's doing is to say that, tell me what are the, uh, the, the amounts of orders that the different nations are ordering in each given year. Okay? So saying that India ordered 25 billion uh, uh, um, rupees worth of telecom equipment in 1975. Then 1978, it ordered 50 billion of this, and so on. So this is what this query is actually doing. And here we have two parameters here, which tell you what is varying here. One is the account balance of the supplier, and the other is the supply cost from this of these parts. Okay? So don't worry about the details. The important thing is that you can draw pictures like this here. Okay? This comes from the Picasso tool that uh, Professor Nahari alluded to before. On the x-axis, you have the account balance. And on the y-axis, you have the supply cost. And on this parametric space, what each of these colors represent is that a certain kind of a strategy is optimal in that space. Okay? Again, we don't have to look into the details of what the strategies are, but each different color is a different strategy. 
Okay? So for example, this strategy in the cricket world will be bat first, this one would be saying bowl first, this one would be saying uh, 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 hope for rain or something like that. Okay? So these are the different strategies. Each of these strategies, now you know how this behaves in this minuscule world of 1 GB, but you want to see how does your system behave when instead you have to try it out in 100 terabytes and you don't want to go through the trouble of creating it and even if you are able to create it, your laptop doesn't have the space to hold it in the first place. But we could actually simulate that environment successfully and show what the same, and this is on a commercial database system again, we could show what this picture looks like, that, that is what this picture looks like if you actually had a 100 terabyte database. Okay? Now you see that the picture looks quite different. The number of different strategies is, goes from 32 to 77. And you also find that the geometries of these contours or the borders between regions also significantly changes. And this is very important from the database designer's perspective. And they can do this for essentially for free because you never have had to interact with the real data. Okay? Everything is being done in the abstract world. Okay? So this is as far as the uh, um, optimization or the planning stage uh, 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 is concerned. We also would like to verify whether the execution is correct or not. So here you have to actually involve the data because you actually have to send the data through these operators and try to figure out whether it's doing the right thing or not. Okay? So for this, again, you now have to mathematically capture high dimensional data distributions with complex constraints. Okay? So hopefully some of what the zero set would come in useful here. Okay? And efficiently generate this data dynamically from these distributions. Okay? Which, which means that you also now require the ability to simultaneously simulate both the input and output for operators so that you can only focus on the components uh, that are of interest to you. So you have lots of different operators in a typical database uh, execution strategy, and you might be interested in only one of them. You might say, I want to look at the group by operator because it is behaving horribly. Let me check it out. You don't want to waste time sending data through all the other operators at, in a, in a, in a uh, 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 slow process. Instead, you would like to be able to immediately jump to the operators that are of interest to you, and then how can you fool the system into actually thinking that there's only this one operator in the whole uh, uh, framework, and ensure that the data that's passing through it is exactly similar to what you had had, had you done it from scratch. Okay? So this is the goal that you have here, and this is currently ongoing work. We hope that within the, uh, by this December, we should have some good results on this as well. Okay? So uh, to wind up, what I would like to re uh, reiterate is that, although many of you might think that testing is a very boring subject, I would beg to differ. I would claim that research on automating big data testing is really great technical fun. And also, as I said, it has this uh, 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 icing on the cake that it is of immediate practical relevance. So please stop protesting and instead be pro-testing. <laughs> Thank you. Time for questions. Please announce your name and also the organization, and then ask the questions. Okay. Uh, Murli Krishna, uh, CSAIAC. I just have a comment on the takeaway. Uh, okay. Instead of automated big data testing is fun, right. automated testing is fun. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, I am Jyoti Ranjan, working for NoSQL Aerospike. So I have a NoSQL question. Whether oh. this tool is applicable to only relational database or NoSQL oh. also we can use? OK, I knew that there would be, uh, OK, just before I answer that question, here uh, to prove that this tool actually exists, here is the user <laughs> interface. And there is a demo which takes a couple of minutes. So you can have a look at it while uh, we go through the questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, so you were talking about the NoSQL part, but as you would see, that even the NoSQL enthusiasts are changing their tune in recent times. They now call themselves as new SQL. Even Google has changed now from being Hadoop and MapReduce enthusiasts. Today they have something called Spanner, which is really a relational database. They just won't say that the word. There's something called F1, which is again their uh, 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 database tool. There are big table. Okay? All of this, so people are coming back to the new SQL world. People are coming back to the transactional world. This was a minor fling that they had saying that I just want to get rid of all of these uh, database things like consistency and asset semantics and so on. But eventually, people will come back to this. And this has been repeatedly happening in the database world. Every five years, as I said, people feel that it's too uh, 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 restrictive and so on. And you want to be bindas and completely doing something new, come back to the same thing. XML, the same thing happened. They said they don't want any structure. Okay, it should be completely semi-structured, flexibly structured, and so on. Nowadays, you have XML keys and you have XML transactions. Okay. 
Okay. So it will come back in a loop. And so if you look at new SQL, they have all these requirements. But to answer your question, no, this is primarily in the relational database world. But there's nothing which says that you cannot build a similar tool for the uh, no SQL world as well. Okay. Because there also you would like to test out the system before deployment. And testing is an extremely expensive exercise because it's hard to, A, you may not even be able to have the uh, uh, customer's data with you. And B, even if you had it, creating it and processing it may take oodles of time, okay, which you may not be able to afford. Okay. As you saw in the healthcare example, they stress tested it one day before the release of the portal. Okay, And uh, I think one day is a lot, actually. <laughs> So given that, can you come up with some way of testing which is not so intensive on the resources? Or at least you can use this as the first cut, and then maybe do a few actual deployments to figure it out. But this gives you a cheap and dirty way of uh, uh, checking out things in advance. Okay. And uh, what is the difference? Means uh, Is there a difference uh, with this tool uh, without data testing and with data testing, or it's same? Uh, Oh, as far as the metadata part is concerned, the, the database query optimizers or the planners always only look at the metadata. They never look at the real data. Okay. So in that sense, it will be identical to that uh, situation. Okay. But if it comes to execution, then you'll obviously start running into trouble. So there we have to figure out how do you again fool the system into processing only the data that you want and not have this whole oceans of data coming in through the system where you have to painfully wait for those things to be processed before it comes to the operator of interest. Okay. So that's what we are currently working on. There's one question there. Uh, this yeah. is Amit from Sprinkler. Uh, yeah. So does it also allow us to identify the efficiency of the queries? Uh, no, in the sense that <coughs> even in database systems where you do have all the data, whatever you plan for is completely different at runtime. Okay. Because it's all based on estimates, and those estimates are often largely wrong. So this is uh, not talking about whether it is efficient or not, or whether the strategies that are being picked up are good for your query or not. This is just saying that, how can I test what your system would have done if it had this environment? Now, whether that's good or bad is a separate issue. Because even in standard database systems, this is largely an unsolved problem in the sense of that, uh, uh, can you say a priori whether the solution that you have for a particular query is going to be good or not? Okay. Usually, crossing your fingers, breaking a few coconuts at Tirupati, that will do the trick. Okay. Otherwise, it's really an art and not a science. Yeah. There is one question. Yeah. Hi, I'm Gunjan from uh, IAS itself. Uh, part of my question was actually asked by the f uh, gentleman asking the first question. But I also want to additionally ask about the streaming data. Now, uh, I have worked with both. RDBMS as well as NoSQL data. And in my little experience, what I have observed is when it comes to streaming data, MongoDB, Cassandra, etc. are far right. better right. as compared to RDBMS. So uh, I mean, what are your comments on that? No, th that is certainly true that uh, if you don't have data at rest, which is in some kind of repository where you want to evaluate things, certainly the streaming databases can only be handled by systems that do very little with it, okay, by just looking at the values and passing it on. But if you want higher level semantics, which invariably want. So as I said, even Google, which was the primary proponent of all these technologies, has now quietly turned tail and said, hey, maybe they were not so bad. Okay? So uh, if you are only having streaming data, we want to do approximations and so on, then you can, as long as you have sublinear algorithms, you are fine, because you can use those to get approximate answers. But if you wanted these higher level semantics that are usually associated with database systems, then obviously that won't be a good idea. Okay? So for generic streaming data, that's uh, Uh, hi, uh, I'm Devesh. I'm from Motorola Mobility. And uh, my question is like this, uh, on this automation tool uh, you are using, suppose uh, I have a, uh, I, I want to test the dictionary word. And uh, like uh, on Twitter and post Facebook, people are writing. <coughs> uh, this about Thank you. Uh, like, uh, if I, I want to test the dictionary word, but it is a correct word or not, and using this automation tool, like this such type of tool, and uh, like Twitter and uh, everywhere, people are writing like some words they are writing and then putting star, star, star. Then how can this tool will this automation tool will uh, test that whether this uh, this is a dictionary word or not? Okay, I don't think this tool is meant yeah. for those kinds of uh, purposes, which is where you are looking for. 
saying that whether some kind of a stemming is being done correctly or not of the words, if I understood you right. That is more in the document and IR world. This is looking at heavily structured data. So for example, the insurance industry or even the healthcare industry, as I said in the, uh, uh, the Obama portal, because there, there are going to be issues of uh, uh, people signing up for various kinds of uh, policies and so on, and all these have to be done under transactional consistency requirements. There is money involved and so on. So this is primarily meant for being able to project into the future without paying the cost for it. Or at least doing the initial parts of this checking without paying enormous amounts of cost in doing that. But for the kinds of checking that you are saying, that, that will be more in the document or IR world, where they would like to check whether the appropriate stemming has been done or not. Right? Thank you. That will be uh, the last question. Let's say suppose you go to a go to a company where they have a they have a huge database and they have they have the data they have their uh, call tables and stuff like that and instead of actually they have huge data instead of actually testing it, is there a way in which you could just uh, read analyze the data get some statistical properties out of it and then perhaps build a model and say that if testing was done you would get that much errors is is there is there such a study is it possible? Uh, you're saying the error in what, in the terms of the results? You're no, no, saying, so suppose uh, they have a database and you yeah. want to, the, the correct way to do is to just go and test queries on it to see if it returns a, a proper value or not. Right. Instead of actually doing the testing, right. is it possible to kind of make a model out of it and predict that if tested, how much errors would come out of it? Uh, what you could possibly do is the other way is to say that, can I take the appropriate sample from the original database that is sufficient to test all the queries to correctness or not? That is part of what the reverse query processing is done, doing. It's saying that I know the results and I know the database, uh, sorry, I, I know the results and I know the queries, can you come up with the appropriate database for it? So that would be the kind of uh, modeling that you are talking about where I want to come up with a minimal database that will satisfy both these queries and these results so that you can then check whether, it, uh, so you don't have to have the original whole humongous database, you just require the appropriate uh, 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 subset that would allow you to do this checking. So if there are no more questions, I think uh, it is time to really thank uh, Professor Jayan Haritsa and reassure him that <coughs> we were absolutely delighted to have invited him to give this talk. And thank you very much. <coughs> I think it's about to rain outside. Uh, it's very, very symbolic. We had a lightning talk by Professor <laughs> followed by a thunderous talk by uh, <laughs> Professor Jayan Haritsa. Uh, let me make... Uh, a couple of very brief announcements. Uh, the next set of talks will be on the June 10th, which happens to be a Tuesday from 4 to 5.30. Uh, the talks, uh, the first talk will be by Professor Chandra Murthy. It will be on spot signal recovery. And the second talk uh, will be on mechanism design for strategic networks, crowds, and markets. So these two lectures will be on June 10th, which happens to be a Tuesday. And uh, there is a YouTube channel on uh, the Big Data Initiative, which has been created. And some of the previous talks have already been uploaded to this website. Please take a look uh, if you did not go through those lectures. And uh, the Big Data Initiative, apart from the public lectures that we have, also is lining up a series of other initiatives. And uh, if you have any queries, any questions, please do email at bigdata.csa.iisc.ernet.in. And uh, so thank you again for coming. And we have uh, some coffee and tea waiting. I would like to invite you all for coffee and tea. Thank you.